God chooses to feed the prophet Elijah. How does he do it? With ravens. I wouldn't do it that way. I just wouldn't do it that way. There's something that takes the appetite away when you see the raven's beak open and it, it doesn't make me hungry. And so, so, but God does it that way. And then not only does he do that, he does something that almost seems bizarre. In fact, some people might say that's a little cruel because God, in taking care of the prophet and making sure that he's fed, then leads him to a widow who has so little and leads him to her to ask for a drink and ask for bread to eat. And she's saying, well, all I really have, I've got a little bit of flour, I've got a little bit of oil, and it's all I have, and it's for me and for my son, and then we'll die. That's rather cruel to go to somebody who is so little and say, I need drink. I need food. But what is God doing? God is behind the scenes. And what others look at and say, God, you're unfair. That's cruel. That makes no sense. The prophet understood something. He would ask her because he knew that in asking her, she was going to be brought into blessing. And in asking her, there's going to be miracles take place. And in asking her, God activity is going to happen in natural earth. And that's what we need to understand is that even when we're going through difficult times, God is allowing us to be at a moment in which he's going to blow the doors off the place with his presence and his spirit and his wisdom being revealed. Can you say amen? amen. Mystery, the word, is a, is a word we use certainly in English. It came from a Greek word, and that Greek word is mysterion. And it means this, that which is beyond the range of natural understanding. In Joshua 5, 13 through 15, and uh, the book of Joshua is just an amazing book. If you're wondering, uh, you're thinking, where should I read in the scriptures next? You might want to read the book of Joshua. It's just a wonderful uh, book, so much uh, to it. Let's look here at the 13th through the 15th verses. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, okay, natural understanding and, you know, I'm thinking, come on, we've got an angel of the Lord standing there. I want to hear he's for me. I want to hear he's for him on my side. What's Joshua feeling when he says, are you for me? Are you for the enemies? And he says, neither. And, and you know, well, then what am I doing? I mean, I need your help right now. I'm trying to do a major deal right now. And God, I need to know you're on my side. What is happening here is that this representative of our God is basically saying these words. God will not be conformed to your plans. Man must be conformed to God's plans. And when you desire to know the will of God more than anything else, and not only to know it, but to do it, then what God will do is you're going to see that he will use you in your generation in a way that will amaze you. But as long as you have your man-made list, and now you're saying, God, I want to conform you into this box that I've now made of my dreams and my wishes, and I don't get why you're not blessing them, the reality is God will bless you, but you need to move into the arena and environment of the blessing. And that's where God is already at work. He has a plan, and he's unfolding it. In Joshua 6, 2 through 5, the scriptures say, Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpet, trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. By the way, how many of you have, have heard a shofar? You've been, uh, sorry, you heard the shofar? Yeah, you're not going to hear it this morning, but it is a wonderful experience when you hear it. We just don't have one here. It really gives a sense. It brings you into that sense of what, what, what that moment would, would be like. Um, on the seventh day, march around the se uh, city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will, will collapse, uh, and the people will go up, every man straight in. Okay, um, I'm supposed to walk around 
uh, I like the fact, actually, that Elijah is ready to preach with me. There's a future right there. I'm telling you, there's a future right there. We've got to lift our voices. Now, now, this is interesting. I'm supposed to walk around these walls of this city. I'm supposed to walk around the wall. I'm supposed to do this seven times, and I'm supposed to shout. Number one, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Let's just get real. There goes my reputation. It's gone. Number two, I'm, I'm taking all these armed men with me. This is, this is our, these are our men ready for battle, and, uh, and, you're, and you're asking me to make them vulnerable. If I've done it once, I've done it twice, they'll know I'm going to do it a third and a fourth and a fifth time, uh, possibly, and these men are now made vulnerable. That makes no sense. That's not, that's not strategically wise. It's not practical. And I think that things need to look practical, and I need to understand them. I don't get that. It's just not something that I embrace. It's a seeming waste of my time. Some people think prayer is a waste of time. Others know that it takes a nation with the gospel. John Wesley understood that. He'd get up early in the morning before the light of day, and I have knelt at the very place that he would kneel, and that Charles uh, Wesley would kneel at Epworth in England. And I've knelt in their home right on those same pieces of wood, and I've just thought, God, do it again. Grab a hold of England. Grab a hold of Europe. Grab a hold of the world. Put a fire in me like what was in John Wesley so that I am not mediocre in my faith, so that I'm not more comfortable watching TV than I am sharing the gospel. Let me be willing to go anywhere, do anything. This man understood that. He lived to a ripe old age. He had an energy of younger men, far beyond the energy of a young man, in going even into the deep old age of his later life, sharing the gospel everywhere he went. This type of sense we need to have. This type of sense we need to have. So, uh, people say prayer is a waste of time. John Wesley knew different. God is at work preparing their hearts. Seven times? Why seven times? Certainly it's a number of completeness. Yes, we know that. But there was a sense in which they were being prepared. Imagine the first time you go around. And then the second time that you're going around and you can sense the, the, that others are there with you. And you can sense the faith of Joshua there, and you can sense that, wait, God is in this. Imagine what you're feeling by the third time around, and by the fourth time around, and by the fifth time around. It is increasing their faith. It is getting them to a point where their hearts are prepared, for they must now be ready for a future in which what they've been praying for has now happened. We see that happening here. Their hearts are being prepared. I've watched, I've watched females become mothers in nine months. Why nine months? Why didn't God just allow something to happen instantly? That all of a sudden, okay, now she's with child, and she delivers that child in one week, and here's baby. doesn't happen that way. I've watched as the emotional side of things begins to come conform to an understanding of, I have a real love for this one inside of me. I am a mom. And all of a sudden, emotionally and in every way, and it's a paradigm shift, but God waits on us. God expects us to, at times, wait on him. In the Psalms, in the 27th chapter, in the 14th verse,